I bring to you uh, Dr. Emily Kaspar. Uh, Emily, welcome back to Quantum Photonics. Thank you, Cecile. I'm glad to be there. Yes, yeah, so uh, last time um, uh, people were really um, admiring the work that you had and uh, now we are glad that uh, you are back here with more information because I saw you in on Twitter traveling to uh, really uh, re remote locations and uh, mm -hmm. uh, do uh, spending a lot of time in your research. So uh, I'd like to give the mic back to you to listen to your presentation. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I've been traveling quite a lot. Um, and as you will see in the presentation, even though I'm a neuroscientist and I, of course, do studies in uh, the laboratory, uh, in laboratory settings in universities, I also think that uh, approaching the question of obedience and our disobedience should anyway take also the perspective of the people who are directly involved uh, into these actions. That's why uh, I'm also traveling quite a lot uh, in Rwanda and in Cambodia to also study directly uh, former genocide perpetrators, but also rescuers. So I will present that here. So I think, um, Cecile, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, listeners have access to the slides so I can just go through them and sometimes re-mention uh, where I am. Yes, uh, the slides are already posted at the top of the screen and uh, you can mention the slide numbers from time to time so that mm -hmm. the audience will be able to follow it. So, okay. of course, most of our uh, audience really look at the slides and you've got fantastic slides. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, actually, we can uh, start directly with uh, slide number two, where I will just uh, show how the presentation is going to be uh, presented. And it's going to be through two main research questions uh, that are actually driving a lot the research I'm conducting. The first question um, is more like, why there are so many human beings and even civilians, not only military, who choose to join or support uh, genocidal regimes. Because actually, and I'm going to mention it for uh, the studies that I did in Rwanda or in Cambodia, uh, even though there were armed militias or uh, military personnel who did took part, who did take part uh, in the atrocities committed, actually lots of civilians who had never joined or never killed anyone uh, before, actually joined uh, these genocidal regimes and start killing each other, even closed ones like neighbors on our relatives sometimes. So one part of the talk uh, would be to, and that's something I approach in the book, would be to understand how is that possible that receiving orders bring such a change in how people act and to answer this question, uh, we will see the perspective of uh, former perpetrators, but uh, also what is happening in the brain of people when they obey orders. And uh, for the second key research question, actually, um, I did wonder, and I'm going to show you some of the results, what differ between those who really participated in genocidal actions and those who instead risk their own life to save others. And that's something that has been observed in many genocides and, and notably in Rwanda, because those people are still alive. So uh, that's experimentally easy to, to reach them. And it's very interesting because we, we talk about people who have the same ethnicity, same religion, same culture, same history, same socioeconomic background. And in a genocidal action, in genocidal process, you have some people who will participate and kill others and you have a few others that will instead risk their own life to rescue threatened human beings. And that's a critical scientific and societal question to actually understand what differ uh, between them. So actually, when I give a talk on this topic, there is someone I like to, to mention, that's Howard Zinn, uh, who wrote that historically, the most terrible things, war, genocide and slavery, have resulted not from disobedience, but from obedience. 
And actually, if you go on uh, the next slide, uh, number four, this is something uh, obedience that have been observed in many different genocides. So for instance, you have the Nuremberg trials where uh, senior needy officers claimed that they were just uh, following orders. And what is interesting in that situation is that some people, and perhaps rightly, have claimed that this was just used as an excuse to try to diminish their own responsibility in court. And indeed, those people were imprisoned together. They tried to come up with a defense uh, with their lawyers. But what is interesting is that you find exactly the same justifications in uh, justification in totally different contexts. For instance, uh, during the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, and I'm going to show you um, some graphics, uh, some graphs after. Uh, the huge majority of former perpetrators, they explained that they joined um, the genocidal process because they followed orders. But while for the Nuremberg trials, these were military officers accustomed to follow orders and directives from superiors, civilians are less frequently in that position. And during the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, there were many civilians who suddenly started joining the movement. Um, but still, it's a different culture, a different historical event, but they, anyway, they use the same justifications. But we could say that in Rwanda, they were also all put on trial uh, during the Gachacha court. And so perhaps this is also a justification that they developed just to be accounted less responsible for what they did. But then when we get interesting into uh, the genocide in Cambodia, actually it's very specific there because a quarter of the Cambodian population was killed during the Khmer Rouge uh, regime. But those people, most of the time, I mean, the majority of them have never feared prosecution or have never been incarcerated and will never be because only five people were judged uh, responsible for uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, genocide. And it means that these are people who have never have to who never have to had to, to develop any defense line, were not incarcerated and will never fear prosecution, but still they come with they have exactly the same justification. So here for instance on the next slide I can show you some of the results. So the first one is about Rwanda where I interviewed uh, more than 60 former genocide perpetrators and among several questions uh, that I present in the book I especially ask them why they did participate in the genocide why they killed other human beings and as you can see roughly 70 percent of them reported that it's because they followed orders or obedience so that's quite a, a big majority other people mention um, obedience because they were forced uh, with some coercive elements. And then you have other reasons such as, such as group attacks. Uh, so in, during the genocide in Rwanda, uh, many people uh, were organized into groups uh, who went on uh, killing and hunting um, the Tutsis. And uh, other mentioned that they just wanted to loot or because of ignorance. But we see the weight of obedience to authority here. But interestingly, Interestingly, on the next slide, you can see the results that we obtained uh, in Cambodia, where also interviewed about uh, more than uh, 50 former Khmer Rouge uh, members. And here, 100% of the respondents explain that they just followed orders. Sometimes they report elements of coercion, uh, elements of coercion but that's not very uh, systemical and also not very clear. And so... Yeah, actually, that's very striking that you have different events, but they still do mention the same reasons. But of course, here, I mean, these are numbers. And I just put on the next slides, uh, I, I, I will not have time to present all of them, but they are reported in the books, uh, where actually, you see beyond numbers, uh, what some people reported. So for instance, uh, those were classified as obedience uh, for their, the reasons that they provided. 
uh, they reported the following. So, for instance, one reports it is bad leadership that instructed us to kill people and become animals, even though we were not animals. Yes, it is a leadership that did this, not us. And, for instance, another respondent is going to claim I committed the crimes because of the bad governments that were there at that time. It was not me, as they instructed us to kill. And you see that... They all mention obedience, but of course the, the human element is also quite strong actually when you when you interview those people and you try to understand uh, them. But it anyway leads to a very critical question. Why there are so many human beings on different continents in different eras that use exactly the same justification to explain the atrocities they commit? So before going further, um, I would like to mention, of course, that obedience to authority is not the only factors that explain a full genocidal process. So as you can see on the following slides, usually a genocide arouse, arises because of a lot of different events and circumstances uh, that played over the years. Uh, you can have uh, economical or social or political instability, you start to have process of categorization uh, between groups of the population, of dehumanization. So obedience to authority is just one of the steps that explain that a genocide occurs. But it seems that it's a very important one, but of course it's not because suddenly someone asks you to kill other people that a lot of majority uh, that the majority of human beings will do it to 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 succeed in the implementation of a genocide those previous steps are also mandatory so to study experimentally obedience to authority actually uh, what i uh, did on a slide number 10 is to show you some of the studies that existed uh, in the past uh, to show how it was um, studied in the lab context so for instance in 1924 uh, an experimenter, um, Landis, uh, designed a study where he wanted to study the emotional reactions of people when they were confronted to different events, such as listening to music or reading the Bible or so. And in one of those situations, uh, he actually uh, asked uh, his participants to sit on the table uh, where he put a live rat with a butcher knife and he asked his participants to decapitate the rat uh, who was alive and actually it was absolutely not mandatory for participants to do it they had no elements of coercion nothing and yet he observed that 17 out of 20 out of 24 did it um, but if we have to speak about uh, the most famous studies ever conducted uh, on obedience to authority it's probably those of stanley milgram um, he did very famous studies, you probably have heard of this, uh, because it's reported in books, in the media, movies, it was on Netflix, documentaries as well, so it's really massive. And actually, uh, Milgram developed these studies because um, he watched, such as many other people at that time, uh, the trial of Adolf Heichmann, uh, Heichmann, one of the Nazi officers uh, that was responsible for the Holocaust. Uh, and he, he watched his trial on TV and Heichmann, as the others, claimed that he was not responsible because he was just following orders. So Milgram developed the idea of trying to, to capture this in a lab and try to test somehow the limits of human obedience. And so he created a study where actually a participants um, endorsed the role of a teacher and had to teach to a student pairs of words. And each time the student uh, was making a mistake, uh, the teacher, so the real participants, had to send a painful electric shock of increased intensity. So he had a machine where actually the shock uh, level start like very low but then increased up to a shock that was potentially lethal for uh, the students. The whole situation actually was fake and uh, the student uh, was actually a confederate of the experimenter. And so what happened during the task is that on purpose, the student 
started giving false answers to force the real participants to administer shocks of an increased intensity. And actually, when the, when the real participants sometimes doubt, had doubts uh, regarding the procedure, the experimenter was there to try to motivate him to continue, like by saying, the experiment requires you to continue, or uh, I will take responsibility, you can continue. And um, actually, uh, before uh, uh, conducting the study, Milgram asked, um, has the prediction for the results to experts in uh, human behaviors with notably, notably psychologists and psychiatrists. And the striking part is that actually they all predicted that no one would ever administer a potentially lethal shock to another person just for the sake of a study. And they all pre and they predicted that they would anyway stop when uh, the other fake participants will start complaining. But it's not at all what uh, Milgram observed. He observed in, him, in one of his initial studies that 65% of the participants administer a potentially lethal shock to the other person just for the sake of the study they were involved in. And no one stopped before uh, 300 volts, which was already very high. So this study profoundly changed the way we see obedience to authority. But for a lot of ethical reasons, uh, it's not possible anymore to replicate Milgram studies because it caused a lot of distress to participants who really believed that they were killing another human being. And so what we did uh, on the next slide is actually we created another task that would be adapted to neuroscience and where we could also study how obedience influenced the brain. Because with Milgram studies, we actually know that people are obedient, also in an experimental context, but we don't know why they are obedient. And so uh, in the experiments created, uh, we actually had uh, two real participants. One was assigned as an agent and another one was assigned as a victim. And the agent had two buttons, a shock button and a no shock button. And so when they, they were told that when they would press the shock button, they would deliver a real painful electric shock to the victim in front of them. But in exchange, they would earn five cents. When they would, if they would press on the no shock button, they would not deliver the shock, but they would not earn the money. So here the shocks were real, but actually calibrated on the pain threshold on the victim. So it's not like in Milgram uh, studies where the shock were fake, but they increased in intensity until death. Here they are real, so that we don't use deception. We don't uh, lie to participants, but the pain threshold is set up before the experiment starts and doesn't change during the entire procedure. So here uh, we decided to test uh, obedience, uh, what happened in the brain when people obey orders by contrasting two experimental conditions. So in the first one, uh, people are actually entirely free to decide um, which uh, button to press. So they have to make the decision during 60 trials and on each trial, they are totally free to decide if they want to send the shock or not. Uh, in the coerced condition, the experimenter was actually giving them on each trial an order to send the shock or not to the victim. So with this experimental procedure, actually we studied different processes that happen in the brain of the agent to see how obeying orders impacts or not the brain. And I'm going to mention some of, some of them. Um, and uh, the first one I'm going to start with is what we call the sense of agency, which is on slide number 12. So the sense of agency, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept, but is the fact that uh, when you perform actions, you know that you are the author of that action. So it may seem obvious, but actually the sense of agency is disturbed in uh, different uh, psychiatric diseases, not, um, notably with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia patients, they make actions, but it's not voluntary. They cannot, they don't really know that they are the author of their own action. And that's also why they are considered as less responsible in court. So, but for healthy human adults, we all have the experience of agency. If, for instance, I take a pen with my hand, I know I'm the author of that action. 
And because we have a sense of agency, we also know that we are responsible for the consequences of our actions because we know we caused them intentionally. Um, however, the difficulty is how to measure the sense of agency because it's a subjective experience and actually that's a huge difficulty in neuroscience is to study consciousness. Like this is something we all know that we have that other human beings have as well, but how can we capture and measure this subjective experience which is caused by the brain but we're very still far from knowing exactly how it is caused. And so to measure the sense of agency, well, one option is to ask people how they feel, like we ask them to perform an action and we ask them, well, do you feel that you're the author of that action? But the problem is that it's highly biased by social desirability. Uh, for instance, uh, we all know that people, humans, have the tendency to increase their involvement or responsibility when the outcomes of their action is positive and to decrease it when the outcomes of their actions are negative. And so we rather prefer to use implicit measurements. And one of them is based on time perception, which is presented on the next slide, uh, number 13. So the connection between the sense of agency and time, per time perception can, uh, can appear a bit weird, but uh, let me explain with an example. So for instance, um, if you are in the waiting room of your um, uh, GP uh, and, for instance, the GP is delayed and you are waiting, if you have nothing to do, if you haven't taken anything to read or you don't have anyone to talk to, you will have the impression that the time goes very slowly. While, on the other hand, if you took a book to read, if you took your computer, or if you talk to family members or to your friend, you will have the impression that the time goes faster. While actually, at the physical level, the time goes exactly at the same speed in the two situations. And actually, some researchers have found that there was a link between time perception and the sense of agency. And they have shown that when people make voluntary actions, they have the impression that the time goes faster than when they do involuntary actions. For instance, when we use uh, some um, neuroscientific methods uh, to stimulate some brain regions, which cause um, an action in participants. And so, for instance, a typical task is to ask people to press a key, and then after a few hundred milliseconds, they will hear, hear a beep, and they have to report how many milliseconds uh, elapsed between their key press and the tone. Uh, and so the advantage of that measurement is that although this is only an implicit marker of the sense of agency, people have no way to guess what we are experimentally assessing. Um, so if we go back to the task on slide 14, actually the way it worked in that task uh, is that uh, when agents could press the shock or the no-shock button, a beep followed their action. And they had to estimate the number of milliseconds, the time that elapsed between their key press and that beep. And this is how we measured the sense of agency when they were receiving orders on or where, uh, when they were free to decide. And so... Uh, just as an information, I think the behavioral results are pretty interesting uh, first. So um, when I designed this task, I was very sure that no one would ever deliver a painful shock to the person in front of them for just five cents. And actually, it was very wrong because I observed that in average in the first study, but that's an average that we have replicated many times, people send 34 shocks out of 60 trials freely to the person in front of them, which represent only one euro 70, which is nothing even for a student. Um, something also that we observed um, is that actually no one disobeyed. And I was really surprised by this one because the first study I did was at University College London, where it was university students. Most of them have, have heard about the studies of Milgram so why would they obey and send a real shock to the person in front of them? I mean, here they know it's real. They, they can see the shock administered on the victim and they can see the physical reaction associated with it. And yet no one disobeyed. 
So in a sense, with a different paradigm, we somehow replicated the studies of Milgram, who observed a very high obedience in an experimental context. So if we go back to the sense of agency on the next slide, uh, actually, you can see on slide 15 the results. So here, as a reminder, it was based on time perception. And as a second reminder, uh, the literature has shown that when we produce actions considered as voluntary, we have the perception that the time goes faster, so we report shorter time intervals than when we perform involuntary actions. And here, as you can see, you have in a dark grade uh, the free choice condition and in light grade the coercive condition. Participants systematically reported shorter interval estimates when they were free to decide which action to perform compared to when they were following orders. And actually, that's striking because when you obey an order, you are always the author of that action. There is no doubt about that. But yet, with these implicit measurements, we showed, and we showed it several times because we replicated the effect, that obeying orders reduces the sense of agency compared to acting freely. Then we went and a step further. Um, here, as a reminder in that task, whenever they press a button, they uh, heard a beep, and that's where they had to estimate um, the time that elapsed. And uh, so what we did is that with electron cephalography, we measured how the brain processed the beep signal. Uh, which was an auditory information. And there are different measurements that we can uh, do to, to do that. But with electron cephalography, we most of the time observe a negative deflection in um, happening, like occurring 100 milliseconds uh, in the brain after people hear the tone. And what you can see on slide 16 is that actually the amplitude of this negative deflection was very different between when participants were free and where they were following orders. And what we can see is that the brain uses less information to process auditory instructions after having followed an order compared to when you act freely. And what is striking in this result is that the tones are exactly the same in the two experimental conditions. They do not differ, but yet, the brain processes the information, process less the information when the beep followed an order. So it looks like obeying orders also reduces how the brain processes information. And we have also uh, observed that for other mechanisms, notably empathy. So empathy, that's a critical process uh, for our pro-social uh, behaviors. And actually, that's a deeply ingrained a neural phenomenon. So um, it has been shown uh, in humans, but also in uh, other mammals or rodents as well, that so when we experience pain, uh, we have uh, different brain regions that are activated with uh, that information. So there are brain regions associated with the, the physical experience of pain, but there are also brain regions uh, that are activated and that are associated with this emotional component of receiving pain. And it has been shown using MRI that actually when you feel pain yourself or when you see someone else in pain, uh, this activates similar brain regions. And actually, in neuroscience, this is how we define empathy. It's the fact that when we see someone else in pain, it triggers brain activations in our own brain that are associated with the understanding of that emotional component of uh, the other person receiving pain. And that's a very somehow autonomous process. Uh, it's deeply bi biologically ingrained. And that's most of the time why we do not cause pain to others, because our brain process that pain, and somehow we can feel it. We don't feel the physical pain, but we feel what it's like to feel pain. And I actually wanted to take just one minute to explain how this was discovered, uh, because actually uh, the story is uh, pretty interesting because it was totally random. 
So if you go on the next slide, but I will uh, play it, you, you will hear the sound. Uh, actually, it was in the 90s, and there was a group of researchers uh, who was uh, studying the activity of some uh, neurons in the motor cortex in uh, monkeys that were activated when the monkey was moving. And so the, the, the apparatus uh, was as follows. So actually they put specific electrodes on some specific neurons in the brain uh, of the monkeys, and uh, they were connected to a machine uh, was actually uh, that was actually doing noise uh, each time a neuron was activated. So uh, people knew uh, when um, uh, when the neuron was firing because uh, the machine was making noise. And uh, one day, actually, a member uh, I mean the the research team went for lunch and but they forgot to turn off the machine. And one of the team members came back to the lab and was eating an ice cream in front of the of the monkey, who was the the, the apparatus. And uh, he started hearing the machine have creating noise, but the monkey was actually not moving at all. And actually, he had just discovered mirror neurons. So these are neurons who activate both when you perform an action and when you observe this action in others. And actually, this is something that is also thought to be the process in humans for empathy. Like we have mirror neurons in some brain regions that allow us to feel pain, but also to experience the pain of others. And so I'm just going to display the video, but actually since the slides are in PDF, I don't know if you're going to um, be able to see it. So perhaps um, I will not display the video, but it's very interesting and it's available on YouTube actually, because it shows that uh, when the movie, uh, when the movie, when the monkey moves, um, you, you can hear the sound of the machine. And then when you see the monkey not moving, but the researcher in front of him moving, you also see the noise of this machine. So that, that's very interesting. But then uh, based on this, we also wanted to study if obedience to authority would influence how we process the pain that we cause to others. So if you go to slide 19, uh, you can see the setup that we did with fMRI, where we actually again had this experimental condition with agents and victim, and agents um, actually were inside the MRI scanner, and they could see the victim located outside uh, the MRI scanner um, receiving shocks, and one uh, in a free choice condition, and one in which uh, they receive orders from the experimenter. And the results were very interesting as well. That's what I show on slide 19, uh, 20. Um, actually, the shocks received by the victim were exactly the same in the two experimental conditions, and participants knew that. And yet, we observed that when people obey orders, it reduces activity in empathy-related brain regions compared to when they are acting freely. So it's interesting because it shows that even though the pain is the same, just because you follow an order, your brain will not process the outcome of your actions as painful as if you're free to decide to do this action. And uh, we also uh, analyzed the brain regions associated with uh, the feeling of guilt. And we also observed that when people obey orders, they have reduced activity in brain regions associated with guilt compared to when they are acting freely. So it really shows, uh, if you go on the next slide, that obeying orders have a lot of impact on how the brain process information. And when we wonder, like, how can humans commit atrocities when they follow orders? Well, actually, we have observed that following orders reduce the sense of agency, the sense of the feeling of responsibility, activity in empathy-related brain regions, activity in brain regions associated with guilt. It really has a lot of effect. And all these processes has been linked with pro-sociality and moral behaviors. So that actually probably explain why uh, and how people can commit atrocities just because they follow orders. And of course, short disclaimer, it's not because we find this at the neuroscientific level that it means that uh, it should have an impact on uh, the law. Perhaps it should, perhaps it should not. It's actually 
not uh, something, um, um, I'm not an expert in this, but because in the end, obeying orders is somehow always a decision. You receive an order, but you're still the one executing the action and somehow having a choice, which of course differs a lot between with contextual events, like if there were elements of coercion or not. But it's interesting to see that, I mean, perhaps some people use it in court to reduce their responsibility, but this is also something we observe uh, in the brain when this is happening. And in the second line of research, and you can go on the next slide, we were also very interesting in what is happening when people resist and say no, actually, when they receive orders. And uh, we did different studies, uh, notably with MRI, but also, and I'm going to show you next, uh, on uh, actual former perpetrators and rescuers uh, in Rwanda. And we have observed uh, with MRI that actually when people disobey immoral orders, so it means when they receive the order of the experimenter to send a shock to the victim, but they resist and press the no shock button, it's actually a lot of processes that are involved. And that's actually the difficulty of studying human decision making. We have a lot of things that influence our behaviors. And here we have observed that, for instance, I'm going to talk about empathy or guilt. When we look at those brain regions, they are also correlated with uh, the number of times people can resist orders to hurt another person. So it looks like, indeed, um, if you have a greater empathy or you feel more guilt or more sense of agency uh, when you obey orders, you are going to be able to disobey, to disobey more if you think it is necessary. But um, as mentioned, uh, yeah, I'm also very interested and I think it makes even more sense to study these questions in people who did really uh, committed atrocities or rescued people, uh, people during genocide. And this is not a new question to understand what differs between them, but there are not that many studies because actually they are very difficult to find. I mean, finding genocide perpetrators, even though there have been lots and there still are lots of genocide actually happening on Earth, accessing uh, the perpetrators is not easy because, for instance, um, in some countries, most of the countries, the genocides are not officially recognized. So as... <laughs> As a researcher, I cannot go there and ask to meet with those people because the governments will not allow it. So I need to find countries or other researchers uh, need to find countries where the genocide are officially recognized and those people are still alive and accessible, which actually restricts quite a lot uh, the options. And actually understanding why some people fall prey to hateful propaganda and participate in genocide and why other people instead resist is, as I said, not a novel question. Uh, there was an initial study that was conducted in the 80s by the Oliners. Um, that's uh, what I show on slide uh, 23. Uh, and they actually recruited rescuers, non-rescuers or bystanders and survivors from the Holocaust. And they focused a lot on personality traits. And they found that rescuers had exceptional moral qualities, strong commitment to help others, and were connected to a shared humanity. So shared humanity is when people actually, they don't recognize that human beings can be split into different groups. For them, human beings are all the same. And they actually... ECHO, another study that was done in 2007 uh, on rescuers of the genocide in Rwanda, where uh, they report a higher social responsibility, moral uh, reasoning, and more altruism. And so it looks like personality traits can be something that differs between rescuers and perpetrators. But as outlined on the next slide, this doesn't explain any, everything. First, there are some people who adopted or endured different roles during genocide. You have some people, for instance, in Rwanda, who uh, rescued their family members, but killed other people also during, uh, that were from the other ethnic group. Or you have people who started killing 
and then realized that what, what they were doing was wrong and stopped. So actually, personality traits does not explain anything. And when you consider the amount, the number of people who took part in genocides, that's actually quite a lot. And we cannot just resume all of them as having dark personality traits. This doesn't work. Perhaps for some people it explains, but clearly it doesn't explain anything, uh, everything. And uh, other researchers as um, rather focused on contextual factors. Uh, this is what I show on slide 25. So, for instance, uh, we studies conducted notably in Rwanda. They have shown that many rescuers, they didn't act alone. They actually acted as rescuers because they were supported by their family or by their village. Most of them, and that's something I observed as well, because um, we recently collected the data on more than 70 uh, genocide rescuers in, uh, in Rwanda. I'm still analyzing the results. But most of them also knew the victim because uh, it has been shown in the literature that when you know, know someone, you may have more empathy for that person. Um, many of the rescuers also, they didn't help like on their own. They were asked for help by uh, someone who was threatened. Some contextual factors also sometimes uh, mention religion, being older, having a house, being more educated. But actually, there are also plenty of studies showing absolutely no difference on these levels between former perpetrators and rescuers. So it looks like situational factors can play a role. But since not everyone with those situational factors acted as rescuers, it's also not an absolute difference between perpetrators and rescuers. And so actually, this is still rather an open question. And as mentioned, I was uh, recently uh, in Rwanda to recruit former rescuers and perpetrators, but to try having a neuroscience approach to see at least if their brain reacts, reacts in the same way when they are confronted to obedience uh, or disobedience. So, of course, conducting neuroscientific studies in Rwanda, that's something I, I show on slide, on slide uh, 27, that's not common. No one is doing that. Most of the time, neuroscientists, they prefer to stay in the confine of their uh, university labs. They test only university students. And I rather take an unusual approach in the field where I actually travel with my EEGs. And I try to meet people in different regions of the world. I did that in Cambodia as well, to really try more to study those critical societal and scientific questions from the field. Um, so I don't have time to explain how I'm doing that, but uh, the link that you can see there, you can access it. Uh, it's a blog where I describe all these research projects, uh, notably uh, the project that we also conducted with uh, the military are in prison. And so what we did in that study, but it's just preliminary, unfortunately, I'm, we have finished data collection two months ago, so I'm still analyzing the results, but we have collected the brain data with EEG on more than 60 uh, former genocide rescuers, more than 50 genocide perpetrators, and more than 50 bystanders. So that's a very unique population. That's probably the rarest ever population I will ever target uh, with neuroimaging equipment. I mean, I don't know, but still, and of course, I'm really curious to see the results, but just to show you um, the behavioral results. So we did a task where they received orders to take money from another person or not. And we measured how frequently they said no to these orders and resisted to commit these immoral actions. And then we measure also their brain activity at that moment. And actually, a basic prediction based on personality would have said that rescuers would disobey more frequently and more frequently not take the money to the other person because they acted as rescuers during the genocide, they risked their life to rescue others. So we thought that they would act more prosociously than the former genocide perpetrators. But actually what you can see on the next slide is that it's not what we observed. Actually, we observed absolutely no differences between those people. The rescuers, the bystanders, the perpetrators, they all acted the same way. So this was really not expected. And as mentioned, I'm still analyzing the brain results at the moment. And honestly, if you ask me at the moment what differs and what explains that some people become rescuers and other perpetrators, 
I actually don't know at the moment. That's a very good question. And I hope I will find the answer to it because that's a critical scientific question. If we can understand what are the factors that push people to instead rescue life, many genocidal process, many authoritarian regimes perhaps would not have succeeded into uh, killing so many people. So that's very relevant for the society. And I hope uh, I will be able to identify this better. So you can stay tuned. That will not be part on the, of the first book. Uh, that will be part of the next one, probably in a few years. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, uh, I want to uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And don't hesitate if you have any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Emily. So uh, we are uh, opening the floor for questions. If you have questions to our speaker, please feel free to raise your hand and come up the stage. So uh, just to reset the room, I'd like to reintroduce our guest speaker, um, Dr. Emily Kaspar, who is a professor at Ghent University and leads the Moral and Social Brain Lab you will see the link of the uh, about mo the moral and social brain lab at the room chat i had posted it there she specializes in social and cognitive neuroscience investigating neural mechanisms underlying moral decision making and uh, we she has been talking about uh, her recently published book just following orders atrocities and the brain science of obedience from Cambridge University Press, and it is available at Amazon. I also put the link of that there at the room chat. It explores how obeying orders affects the brain. She works with the various populations worldwide, including the fo former genocide perpetrators and rescuers in Rwanda and Cambodia, as well as inmates and military personnel. She received numerous awards, notably the ERC uh, Starting Grant and the Early Career Award from the Society for Social Neuroscience. So uh, I think there are questions on the room chat and uh, yes, uh, someone raised his hand. So I will bring you on stage. Uh, so uh, we will read the questions in a while. I would just like to ask uh, uh, Emily, um, do you think there are certain types of authority, for example, political, military, uh, religious, that people are more likely to obey without question? Uh, and if so, why might this be the case? Or just like what you mentioned earlier, they are all the same. So yeah, I'd like to, you to comment on this. Yes, thank you for the question. So that's actually a very good question. And uh, I have done some studies where I don't check um, specifically the degree of obedience, but I check if the brain processes the same information depending on who is giving the orders. And I did that notably in the military, uh, where uh, for some of them, they received orders from uh, another civilian experimenter. And um, in another, uh, another group, they received order from a higher ranked military officers. And uh, actually, uh, we have observed that the effect on the brain is exactly the same, regardless of who is giving orders. And what I think it means is that it's not that the identity of the person giving orders would not uh, change obedience. Uh, that's probably, but I guess it's very personal based on who you prefer uh, to, to follow. But uh, I think that it means that whenever someone has accepted to follow an orders, whatever the reason, the impact that it has on the brain is the, the same, actually. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, very interesting. Th there is a case, uh, a current case uh, in the Philippines where in, um, you know, there's a cult leader and he has, I think, cases in the US for money laundering and uh, cases in the Philippines for um, child abuse, also um, uh, also rape, and uh, uh, yeah, so many other abuses. And uh, he, there was an arrest warrant uh, given by the government, so he was hunted by 2,000 police in his area um, of the cult. So um, 
it, there was a difficulty even if there was a lot of police personnel and the SWAT team sent to his area because some members of the religious groups tried to protect him and uh, yeah, even went to the extent of doing some kind of violence, uh, even if they knew that some crimes were committed. So this is a very, very interesting case. I was asking you that question because I'm very curious about you know this your study and I hope that in the future, the neuroscience of this can also be analyzed to add more dimension to the study that you already have. Yeah, definitely agree. And that's actually something I'm looking for uh, overall. And I also consider um, deeply this, I mean, cross-cultural studies because human beings may react overall in the same way, but their cultures are other social factors that can influence us and i'm actually i mean at the moment for those questions with perpetrators and rescuers i focus mostly on rwanda because that's actually accessible and people are still alive there but i actually also try to find rescuers in all different regions of the world to really see if we find some commonalities uh, in the way they resist or not just to find yeah, exactly how they differ, but from a multicultural perspective. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. So uh, uh, there, we would like to welcome Meleg on the um, stage. And um, before that, I'd like to read the question by Kyle. Are you able to talk now, Bob, or I think it's better if it's me while you are recovering. So Kyle Dudkul is asking, how does the leadership impact the way orders are received? Following orders in countries ranging from authoritative dictators would be received differently than receiving orders from democratic leaders? So that's his question. Yeah, that's actually a very good one. And I... So actually, that's something I, I thought uh, would perhaps be different. Uh, so I focused on Rwanda at the moment, where the political system is different than in Belgium. At the moment, I haven't perceived strong differences, uh, but it also was not the main purpose uh, of, the, um, of the study. Uh, for instance, uh, we did observe that uh, when we compared uh, Rwandis tested in Rwanda and Rwandis testing and living in Belgium, where the political system is different, where the relationship to authority is also very different, we, also, we observed that the brain processed information differently when they were receiving orders of the experimenter. Actually, we observed that the brain of the Rwandis living in Rwanda was more active when they were hearing the orders of the experimenter compared to those living in Belgium. And actually those in Rwanda were much more obedient uh, in the experiment than those living in Belgium. So it was just a single study and it was not the main question of the study, but it seems to show that the relationship you have with authority can be based on culture, but perhaps also based on the political uh, system in the country does impact how the brain works. But yeah, as mentioned, it's just a single study. And actually, I'm actually uh, considering collaborating with a researcher in political science who studies democracy and authoritative regimes, um, because that will definitely be a very interesting study. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, we'd like to pass the mic to Meleg, who is on stage. Hi, guys. Thank you. Um, uh, hi, uh, Dr. Emil. Um, have you found or, or, or studied um, what I've noticed with people that have very sort of black and white uh, thinking we are the good guys, those guys are the bad guys? Um, is that um, people frequently view themselves as exceptionally innocent um, and without fault and um, you know, we are just defending ourselves from the bad guys. Um, is there a correlation between, let's say, uh, I suppose that you found in the brain, a correlation between um, uh, the ability to completely demonize the other side? Uh, is, is, is there, a, like the brain, does it sort of so offset itself? Like the more innocent I believe myself to be, 
the more evil I can view the other side to be sort of type thinking. I, I've noticed that um, to be often to be the case. I don't know if you could speak to that. Yes, thank you for the question. So actually, uh, that's something I, I'm sure it can play a role, uh, the way we perceive ourselves, but also the way we perceive the other, uh, the person giving us orders, but also the people that we are supposed to, to punish. Um, the only difficulty is that um, experimentally, that's very difficult to, to study because we cannot, for ethical reasons, really induce uh, such feelings for an experimental manipulations because we know that creating differences between human people based on their values, for instance, can have very detrimental effects. Um, but something that is interesting, uh, perhaps to, to complement this, is, you know, for instance, in Rwanda, during the genocide against the Tutsis, that was clearly an ethnical, ethnic cleansing. Uh, and the, the, the Tutsis were portrayed as enemies, are people that had to be killed for the, the sake of the society and so on. And so we could think that these hates of the other group would be a very crucial factor uh, that the perpetrators would mention uh, because it followed, they received such messages for, during years. Uh, it lasted years of uh, hateful propaganda. And actually, it has been noted by me, but also by other researchers, uh, almost none of them mention hatreds of the other ethnic group when asked why they did participate. Like in the, the sample that I have, it's more than 60, only two mention uh, hatred of the other ethnic group uh, compared to all the others. And actually, some researchers have argued that Perhaps these group dynamics can play a role or the way we perceive the other human being, but it's perhaps not the most important factors. And other researchers think that these social dynamics, such as obedience to authority, are actually stronger uh, than, uh, than uh, this uh, group separation between people. But I think that anyway, they play a role together. And during the genocide, for instance, there is a revision of moral values. Uh, what you're doing is not considered as something bad or immoral. It becomes even something good to do to kill the other people because it will save your society, for instance. So this revision of the moral values and what is acceptable or not is also very different in this context. Yeah, I, I've never seen anybody go into a war saying, you know what, we're, we're all crazy. Um, our side's just as evil as the other side. We're just a bunch of crazy people killing each other, just human beings destroying one another. You know, I think very, very infrequently do people go into battles thinking that. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, so there, there definitely seems to be, there's always like, uh, yeah, I'm innocent and the other side is is bad and um, almost seems to be there's a shutdown on self-analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. And actually we can see that with most of the conflicts also currently happening. happening. If you look at the different sides, each side is sure to be right. That's actually very difficult. And I think that's also typical reaction of human beings like we want to defend our group regardless of what is happening so we have confirmation biases we'll defend the groups we think we belong to no matter what most of the time and it's very difficult to go out of this perception to to have this natural tendency to defend our group even if the group is wrong actually and there are a few people who who, who can have it this self-reflection on this but it's not the majority it looks like Wow. That's, thank you, doctor. I think that's interesting. I've always been very self-reflective and um, highly individualistic. Um, yeah, I think um, there must be also a correlation between societies that breed individuals and societies that allow for multiple realities, multi-religious, multi-ethnic groups, different people. 
uh, societies where people, when they wake up in the morning, there's many different ways of doing things rather than there's a right way and a wrong way to do things, or there's a correct religion, or there's an incorrect religion. Uh, mm -hmm. I would hope that a more... Is there a correlation between a more open-minded, multi-reality, multi... I don't know, societies that allow for metacogn meta metacognition, you could say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, societies where people are not absolutely certain that their way of seeing the world is 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 absolute and correct and um mm -hmm. their resistance to obedience is there does that correlation exist it has never been tested experimentally so that's definitely something to that the field should look at okay thank you uh, uh, thank you Milleg. So uh, let's go to Ibrahim, then after that to Jonathan. So Ibrahim, welcome, and Jonathan too. So uh, yeah, I'd like to give the mic to Ibrahim if you have questions. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, so uh, I don't know if Ibrahim is able to unmic. Maybe he is speaking, but he is muted now. I invited him on stage because he posted the question here at the room chat, and I'm going to just read the question. Uh, what about their personal beliefs or cognitive dissonance of obedience of authority? Yes, so um, I indeed did look at some individual differences between people. And um, for instance, something interesting is that regarding, for instance, specific personality traits, I've never found very stable uh, relationship between the abilities, if I can say so, to disobey an order or to obey an order. Although, Sometimes I have this correlation with this cultural relationship to authority. And so it seems that in cultures where uh, obedience or deference to authority is more important, people will obey more, which actually makes sense. But I haven't tested personal beliefs uh, beyond, uh, beyond that aspect. Um, yeah, actually, cross-cultural studies for that are very relevant, but also very difficult to do. Because even if I just mentioned the study on Rwanda, I mean, that's already took three years to be able to achieve uh, the recruitment of that population. And yes, yeah, so that's something I would love to know more, to have some variability in my sample and to be able to assess that. But yeah, <laughs> it's complex. It will come but with time. Thank you. And so we pass the mic to Jonathan. Hi, um, thank you for presenting your absolutely fascinating and um, thorough research on this incredibly important topic. Um, the, it seems to me that um, often at the um, inception of conflict or the preparation for conflict, um, leaders will often switch from appealing to reason, which is a cognitive function, to feeling sentiment and emotion, which is more of a hormonal, uh, hormonally mediated thing, or at least um, uh, has a huge influence on hormones. So I'm wondering if you or other people in your field have done any quantitative analyses of, of hormone levels, such, a, such as adrenaline, cortisol, um, uh, dopamine, um, 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 Adrenaline, yes, adrenaline. Um, is is there is there a, is, is is there likely a hormonal basis to the um, uh, lability, the the likelihood of people engaging in in these actions on the on the on behalf mm -hmm. of authority? Yeah. So thank you for the question. You actually just mentioned one of the projects you are cu currently preparing. And uh, so in uh, the project, we want to focus on oxytocin um, because there are studies who showed that um, the more oxytocin 
for instance, if you uh, take oxytocin, oxytocin spray, it may enhance an empathy for others and mm. helping mm. behaviors. And it has also been shown in rodents. But on the other hand, so in, in that sense, you can think that oxytocin will trigger, let's say, more empathy for the victim. And so people would disobey more. But on the other hand, there are some studies who show that oxytocin increases intergroup biases. So people, when they have this oxytocin induction, they perceive even more difference between them and the others, which can actually have the other, the opposite effect. Hmm. And so we are currently preparing a study where we manipulate um, oxytocin, notably with uh, oxytocin spray, but also a placebo to really see how this can modulate obedience, disobedience mm. uh, towards victim and experimenter. So it will probably take two more years to conduct the studies because that's really not easy. And there is actually a sort of shortage of oxytocin in the world at the moment. Uh, but this is definitely something we're doing. Thank you very much. I've been puzzling over this question for a year. Nice to talk to an actual expert in the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Emil, may I step in one for one question? Mm -hmm. uh, this is very interesting because, um, I don't know, the last couple of months I've gotten into the rabbit hole of um, artificial intelligence, weapons, weapons creations, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think your um, study is extremely, extremely important because uh, so far as I understand with the weapons development is that basically soon enough, the time will come, many experts say 10 years or less, where um, conflicts really can't, can no longer be resolved through military means because the weapons are just going to become far, far too more powerful and too intelligent and too cheap, like very, very cheap. I mean, you know, anonymous drones where that are like 50 cents that can easily kill a couple people and either side of any conflict, even if they have very little money can release millions of them. So, some, mm -hmm. Something like this crazy, crazy scenario is, is not out of the question. So I think what you're doing is very important because we have to find a way, you mentioned oxytocin, but I think it's in the best interest um, in all the governments in the world to somehow get their populations to get along with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, as time goes forward, the weapons are becoming more powerful and the information systems are becoming the, the ability for people to become, to be manipulated in more sophisticated, sophisticated manners. Uh, that's increasing. So I, I think uh, I think you're kind of in a race mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> with this weapons development, and I think you're in a race with uh, uh, very bad social media channels. Yeah, uh, actually, you're totally right. And uh, there are also studies showing that when we use intermediaries, can be weapons, can be other things, uh, it tends to diminish our perception of being responsible for what we are doing uh, because it creates an intermediary between our intentions and the consequence of, of, of them. So it's very, very dangerous. And yeah, for me, actually, one of the worst problems of humanity is this division and this tendency that we, we, we put ourselves into groups. And, and I hate seeing that. And I see that during elections, I see that in so many countries, and I think at some point <laughs> this should really stop, and you're right in that sense, because as long as we continue to perceive each other as different, it will never stop. People will have more and more reasons to create groups, to start wars, to start conflict, and as you mentioned, indeed. But it's difficult to, uh, to, to fight, and yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure if I can even be uh, in a race against uh, the development of these uh, these automatic weapons in a way it's not a fair race i think unfortunately thank you um and uh, uh dude uh, kyle came on stage so i'd like to pass the mic to kyle yeah um 
I did uh, step out of the room for a little bit, but when I came in here, uh, um, it was a very profound conversation um, that you, the two of you are having, and um, it, it it's very interesting uh, because even if the people Um, that are, are the general population. Uh, um, you to have empathy for one another. Um, and do not look at the other as the enemy. Um, it matters more so who's actually giving the orders. And the reason why I ask the question about authoritarian leaders and how that impacts people receiving the orders compared to democratic democratically elected leaders and how that actually operates in the you can be utilized in the possibility. Yeah, actually, I don't know if it was only me, but there were a lot of um, cuts in the signal uh, during the question. So uh, I don't know, Cecil, do you, is it something yeah. that you had as well? There's a lot of static and uh, we could not understand all of the uh, questions that uh, uh, Dudkul asked us, but earlier, uh, I think you wrote here on the room chat that uh, uh, regarding perceived consequences would impact the sense of agency. Uh, he was asking this question, but uh, some of the things that he was saying, I could not understand because of the signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, uh, My apologies. Um, I, I guess in a nutshell, it was just just uh, saying that it, it's um, uh, looking at um, the people with power and how their orders actually impact the general mm. population because the general population can have empathy for others. Um, but yeah. if the people with power are still giving orders uh, to kill yeah. and hurt other mm -hmm. people, um, then how that impacts people. And it seems like uh, authoritative leaders uh, lack empathy compared to democratically elected leaders. Um, and so that might even impact uh, how uh, the order is given. Um, and then I would think that the order uh, being received would the sense of agency um, receiving an order from an authoritative dictator would be different than that of a politically elected um, leader, which you kind of emphasized with, um, with the one study that you did. Um, I was just wondering, um, because of the um, a situation uh, and states of affairs of the world today, um, and the technological advancement and how it's going to impact um, war um, in the future uh, and the conversation you're having. I was wondering, can your work um, be utilized in order to help um, people gain um, a further capacity for, uh, of empathy for others? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. I The thing with empathy is that even though it's... Uh, it's a, it's a neural phenomenon, it's a biological phenomenon. There are a lot of studies that show that it's also a motivated, a motivated phenomenon where actually somehow people can control the empathy they feel for others. And this is typical, for instance, when uh, we uh, have intergroup biases. Uh, many studies in neuroscience have shown that uh, we have reduction, uh, a reduction of activity in brain regions associated with empathy when we witness the pain of someone that we don't consider as part of our own group. And, but the fact that it's motivated and that people can um, enhance their empathy is, um, is very uh, interesting because it shows that actually perhaps it can be modified uh, also by leaders. But of course, in some societies where leaders have full power, that's um that's 
very difficult to do, but that's something that can be trained. So I think there's still hope for that. And yeah, I just wrote it in the chat and unfortunately I'll have another course uh, after. Uh, I perhaps can have time for one more question, but I, I mentioned in the chat to my uh, email address if some people want to uh, have more questions or send me their questions. Yeah, thank you, Emily. So I think there are still other people who would like to ask a question, but I know that we have no time left. We have Jocelyn here on stage and probably we can invite you again to just, you know, have a general discussion or question and answer in the future. But I know you're <laughs> busy. So anyway, we'll give uh, the mic to Jocelyn now on stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Emily, for being here. Now, we heard recently about the electronic devices that have been weaponized uh, and how many people died and, and, and were injured as a result of that. And not too long ago, we heard about the diplomats in Cuba who were the most plausible explanation for their malady was um, directed pulse radio frequency, which caused decreased white matter in the brain of some of the diplomats. And I had a similar experience before the diplomats came forward. I shared my story about being a victim of that type of uh, technology, but I wasn't believed, I was dismissed, I was ridiculed. I went to the FBI, I went to a New York reporter, shared my story, so it's well documented. Um, now, um, I feel I didn't get justice, so my next, best option was the pen. I'm writing a book about this. And I'm wondering how something that's um, ongoing in my case, where I'm tortured daily as a result of what I'm doing. My to daily torture is unbelievable and unbearable. And I'm just wondering how someone like you could help someone like me. Thank you. Yeah, I I'm very sorry. Um... For your story actually and yeah i don't know to what extent i can have i mean the psychologist inside me could uh, as a direct um direct uh, uh, piece of advice would recommend uh some very recent therapeutic options such as emdr for instance that works quite well and that has been shown in scientific studies but actually so that, that's the difficulty. So I'm trying to raise consciousness about all these processes because I'm trying to, to find ways to reduce such events to occur. But, and I'm going to say that I'm just a scientist, unfortunately. And so, for instance, you know, with the book or the research, I, I'm, I'm trying to see what differs between those people because I really think that at some point we can learn something and at least not perhaps help the people who survived uh, such events uh, in the past but that such events will not occur uh, in the future uh, and i think raising awareness is one of the up, uh, one of the key uh, thing and that's why i wrote this book uh, in the format of a trade book for general audience but i'm also trying to do that with um illustrated books for kids at the moment to really take more an educative part uh, where I retrace the stories of rescuers across the world that I think many children across the world will read and identify with uh, because there are studies who showed that when you have role models such as rescuers, many reported that they had also witnessed rescue actions in their families. So I think in a way by raising awareness and by making people more conscious about that, Perhaps at some point we can start making a difference for other people because during genocides, actually, many people that are still alive, they own their life to those rescuers. And if more people acted like them, there would be less victims. So I don't know if I can have a direct impact on those situations, but I would say it's worth trying. And even if it's step by step, little by little, I'm not going to change the world <laughs> like this. And probably even an entire scientific career would not be possible. But I do believe that it can make the difference for some people and by extension, by some potential victims and reduce um, this trauma 
perhaps for some people at least in the world. Thank you for the work you do. You uh, obviously have uh, you're a compassionate, caring person, and I appreciate you very much. Thank you for your answer. Uh, yes, so uh, Emily has to go to another engagement. And mm -hmm. so at this point, we'd like to thank uh, Emily for taking time to um, try to talk about her research with us. And please uh, uh, check her book in Amazon. Uh, I had posted the link here. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Emily. Do you have some parting words for us? Yeah, actually, thank you very much for inviting me and for um, for listening to me. Uh, that's really appreciated. And actually, in the book, there is also a chapter on um, the trauma that all these conflicts cause for the victims and also for the perpetrators. So, yeah, but thank you for the invitation. Yeah, well, we hope we can invite you again <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> Sure. So uh, I'd like to ask Bob if he's able to speak before we close the room. I just wanted to thank you on behalf of everybody in the room for a spectacular presentation. Thank yeah, you very thank, much. Yeah, thank you for being here, Bob, as well. And uh, I'm very glad you have recovered. So we missed you. And at this point, I'd like to give the mic to their cell to help us close the room. And thank you to those who came on stage, Ibrahim, Jocelyn, Jonathan, and all of those uh, in the listening lounge. So their cell mic to you. Thank you, Cecile. And thank you, Doctor, for another great talk. Um, to close the room, we're going to start our countdown from lucky number seven. Is everybody ready? Ready. <laughs> Abraham seven. 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 Jonathan six. Yes. Six. <laughs> Dude five. Five. Jocelyn four. Oh, Bob Thrace. Three it is. <laughs> Cecile Dos Aggies. Didn't hear that. <laughs> there you go. Good doctor, you're number one. And then I'm number one. <laughs> one then. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Emily. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you on the next rooms. Thank you.